I was out of town, but we're going to pick back up where we left off in Romans. Let me mention a few items from our announcements this morning, some changes and new information. Um, on our prayer list, um, I think everybody knew this, that Jim's at home. Um, so we're glad he's doing better. Uh, Margie Holiday recovering from surgery. Uh, Sister Mosier is also going home or scheduled to go home today. Uh, she had surgery and she's got another one scheduled for the 29th. Uh, but she's supposed to be going home today. And uh, as far as family and friends, we need to remember Carmen Stringfellow, Cindy Owens' sister. Uh, she's back in the hospital in Baptist Memphis, I believe. Also, some uh, deaths. Uh, Dan Dawson, uh, his sister died. Carol Bishop. Um, and so we need to remember Dan and his family. And also, of course, uh, most of you probably heard by now, but Jim Brown passed away Friday uh, night, I believe. Uh, Jim and Sherry, former members here. And so uh, arrangements are incomplete but um, we'll get the information out when we know something. So let's remember all of these um, in our prayers. And let's get started with a prayer. Our dear God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy holy and glorious name. Father, we are so grateful for your blessings, your benefits, your loving kindness. We know we've been given so much in this physical world in which we live but especially for the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Father, we pray that we'll be a thankful people, one that's willing to uh, serve Thee, serve others, to uh, defend Your cause, Your word, Your people, and to be zealous of good works and to be a people for Your own possession. Father, we pray that You would forgive us of our sins and transgressions, deliver us from temptation. Go with us through our study that <clears throat> we'll grow and that uh, through our next hour of worship that we'll do so in spirit and in truth. Pray a special blessing upon those or a number that are sick and hurting, those undergoing procedures and, and treatments. Pray your continued blessings upon Sister Dorothy and upon uh, Brother Jim and, and uh, be with uh, Carmen and, and others. Father, we have a long list of those who need uh, your providential uh, care and who need our attention. Pray for Dan and his family and for the Jim Brown family and their losses. And Father, we uh, pray our con your continued blessings upon our nation. We're thankful for our freedoms. We pray that we'll use those freedoms to further your cause. For it's through thy son's holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're in uh, Romans chapter 13. And... Um, We looked at two weeks ago, um, we spent our time looking at our obligation to civil government, and really this all started uh, uh, back in verse 9 of chapter 12, chapter 12 being a very practical chapter on, on Christian behavior and living and attitudes, but beginning in verse 9, he says, let love be without hypocrisy, that is, let it be sincere or genuine and really he begins a discussion of well what is um, how does agape love manifest itself how does it how does it behave it is after all not really so much an emotion as it is a will uh, that says I will put uh, my fellow man's uh, best interest first do what's best for him and frankly sometimes that <laughs> Or a lot of times, that doesn't always mean doing what he thinks is best for him. Um, you know, people in the world think that living ungodly, worldly lives is what life is all about. And that's certainly not what's best for them. Because why? What will they end up finding out in the last day? Yeah, that, they, that their life was, was, was wasted and squandered. And so... If I do what's if I want to do what's best for them, then I'm going to tell them, hey, this is this is not the way to live. You need to 
uh, you need to come to Christ, whatever. Well, they may not always appreciate that. They may not always want to hear that. And so agape love doesn't always, uh, that's not necessarily a uh, let's uh, uh, live and let live, you know, get along, uh, ignore um, what people are doing or, or not doing. Uh, that, that's not what it always entails. Uh, and so I hear all the time, um, um, well, I heard an interesting commercial yesterday. There's some outfit, uh, was talking about the division in our country and, um, but there's some outfit that advertises, um, you call in and maybe they put you on the line with somebody that has views opposite of yours and y'all are supposed to talk and, and I, I guess the idea is, uh, you know, you, you, which there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, I do need to understand other cultures and what other people see from their point of view. There's nothing wrong with that. But then I guess the idea is, is that once we understand that, then we'll all like each other and get along. Well, that's not necessarily the case if what this person is espousing is sinful and, and a violation of God's will. God doesn't ask me to live at, quote, peace with this person. Not that I'm trying to offend or to pick a fight, but I'm certainly not going to compromise biblical values and teaching just so we can say we're all getting along. That's not real peace and that's not real harmony and that's not real love. Um, sometimes, look, there's always going to be division in this world. Always. Uh, and it doesn't need to be frivolous. It doesn't need to be about things that we shouldn't be divided over. And we're going to talk about that in the church as well. But there's some things you just can't, uh, that are going to cause division that you can't do anything about. That's just the way it is. Um, and so Jesus himself said what? I've come to bring a what? A sword? And a man is going to be at, at, uh, at odds with his own family? Various family members and friends are going to be at odds. And people in the first century, when they started obeying the gospel, when these uh, Jews on the day of Pentecost obeyed the gospel, I'm sure immediately there was division, right? Between them and their Jewish brothers who did not obey the gospel. And so agape love is not necessarily always a fuzzy, uh, let's... Uh, you know, live and let live. You, you accept me and all everything I want to do and everything I believe and, and I'll do the same for you. That's not, that's not what it is. And so it, it goes on throughout chapter 13 and, and 14 uh, and into 15. What does it mean to love genuinely, sincerely? And so that got us down to verse 8. We, we were talking about verse 8, I think, of chapter 13 where he says... Owe no man anything except. Well, let's go back up to verse 7 as we finished out that deal on civil government. It's kind of the flip side of verse 7, right? What does he say? Render what? Render therefore to all their due. All right? Owe no man anything. Look, pay, pay your obligations. This is not, this is not some... Um, Judgment or requirement on an economic system where you can't uh, use credit, but what he's saying is, is that Christians do what? They, they pay their debts, they meet their obligations, and they pay their way. They're not, we're not, as Christians, we're not, as we like to use the term, freeloaders. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. I mean, you want to talk about an example. Now, here's a fellow who of anybody had the right to, as he says, live of the gospel, to be paid, right? And yet most places he went, he did what? He provided his own living with tent making. In fact, the only church I know of that he, he allowed to support him financially was which church? Hmm? Philippi. Philippi. He certainly wasn't going to allow the Corinthians to do it because, you know, they were using it as a, some of these churches were using it, you know, his enemies were using, or would try to use it against him. Well, he's just in it for the money. 
He's taking advantage of you. He wasn't going to allow that. So we pay our own way, but his theme here is love. And so we do have a debt. What's our one debt that we can owe? Except to what? Love one another. And there's a sense in which that debt is never paid. It's never satisfied. It reminds me of chapter 1 verse 14, right? What did Paul say in chapter 1 verse 14? I am a what? I am a debtor to who? Everybody. Jews and Gentiles. Why? Why was Paul a debtor? Why did he feel that he was a debtor? But more specifically, what had he been given? Well, he'd been given the gift of salvation, right? And he said, because God has given me this second chance, God has given me an opportunity to be saved, then I feel a debt to offer it to others. And so it's a great motivation for evangelism to feel that way. And so he says here, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, you have a debt to love for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Well, what law are we talking about? Really the law about personal relationships. Jesus said what? They asked him about the greatest commandments. One was to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second, and I don't think he says there, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think Jesus is saying in that passage, this is, this is second in line, it's inferior. He said the second is what? Like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, let me ask you something. So there's three, there's three areas in which I have to love. I have to love God. I have to love my neighbor. That's basically everybody because the, the smart aleck said, well, who's my neighbor? Right. And then I have to love myself. So the question is, which one of those can I leave out and be pleasing to God? Which one can I leave out and say, well, that's not important. But I don't have to love that particular person. Which one of those is going to work? And how, how, how effective is it? How am I going to be able to love the other two without loving all three? It's going to be difficult. So we're loving God. We're loving our fellow man. We're loving ourselves. And that's what we're seeing in all these chapters, 12, 13, 14, 15. What does it mean to love everybody? Because notice, for the commandments, and this is interesting... I mean, think about the Ten Commandments. Most of those, the first few commandments had to do with our relationship to who, obviously? God. But several of the commandments had to do with our relationships with other people. You shall not commit adultery, not murder, you not steal, you don't bear false. If you're, if you're really practicing agape love, if you want to do what's, in, uh, uh, what's best for another, put their best interest first, you're not going to commit adultery with their spouse. You're not going to murder them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to bear false witness against them. And you're not going to covet their stuff. They're all summed up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't injure. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so... Do we love? Do we, doing all these things that are summed up in this one, one command, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And it's not always easy because people are not always lovable, are they? Well, let's look at the rest of it. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You know, we see that uh, metaphor there a lot in the scriptures, right? Putting on the armor. Let us walk properly. Let us... Let us behave correctly. 
as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Um, you know, nobody in the church has any problems with lethargy or apathy, right? We're all gung-ho and on fire for Christ all the time, right? Well, we know that's not true. Reminds you of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3. They were what? They were lukewarm. It's time to wake up and get busy. You're soldiers. Put on this armor. You get closer to eternity every day. Now, some, have, some commentators on this say they believe that the night is far spent. Maybe that's a referral to the um, past life of these Christians before they were Christians. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think there is exhortation there for Christians in every age that uh, we have to be careful about becoming complacent. Um, you know, most of us in this room, I, I would suspect, looking around, maybe not everybody, but most of us in this room, did you know you've seen more years than you're going to see? You ever thought about that? I think about that. I think, man, I'm, and life's moving on. And um, so Jesus told his apostles as he walked this earth, we got to work while it's what? Got to work while it's day. Night comes. Death comes. No man can work. So I have to understand the world doesn't owe me anything. I owe it. Um, and it's interesting here the way he says this. He talks about walking or behaving properly. I think the King James says walk honestly, but that means to walk properly, behave properly. I think is the way the NASB puts it. But these words are interesting. And he says we're not going to, the King James says riot Eh, that's not so much a good translation anymore. Rioting, we usually has a political overtone. It's a, it's a public disturbance, an unlawful lawful assembly of people. That's not what he's talking about here. We know what riots are. We see them on the news too often, both here and abroad. He's talking about revelry. He's talking about partying. That's what he's talking about here. And I think the King James says, chambering, well... Uh, that's debauchery, sexual immorality, illicit relations, so lewdness. And then it says, my version says, not in lust, wantonness, that's sensuality, lust, indecency, licentiousness. These are all behaviors that you know, we see all around us. That's, that's not the lifestyle of Christians, or should be. And certainly not in strife or envy. I think some translations say jealousy. Um, that's not what the Christian's about. But it's interesting here, this phrase he uses, and I don't know, um, I guess you can draw from it, but he says in verse 14 to do what? What does he tell these people to do? What's the first thing he says in verse 14? Put on. Well, didn't these people put on Christ when they were baptized? Yeah, I mean, it could be an, an exhortation to, you know, keep doing it, but then it makes me wonder, too, well, did at some point some of these people put him off? Maybe you need to examine where you're at and the way you're behaving. So, put him on. Put on the qualities of Christ. And it's interesting too here, this word for provision, make no provision for the flesh. Basically what he's saying is don't be overwhelmed with all of the, the secular and worldly pursuits around you. Where, where is my focus supposed to be? Make no provision for the flesh. Well, that doesn't mean I don't go to work and I don't provide for my family, but we all know it's very easy. We always think about the parable of the sower and uh, the, 
that second class of, of soil, it says what? He threw it into this particular soil, but what happened? Well, what, what choked it out? Cares. And see, that's not necessarily an indication that what choked it out, that the things themselves were sinful. Sure, certainly there's, he's listed several things in this context, worldly activities that are sinful, but a Christian can let just the general cares and concerns and pursuits of this world, we get so focused on that that we just get bogged down and choked. And then this lethargy and apathy happens. And so we're not to be anxious for the things of this world. Don't, don't worry about always satisfying your, your physical wants. I mean, we've got to have to take care of our needs. Christmas is always an interesting time as you get older, to me. Uh, you know, kids love it. They have a great time. And I think as adults, we enjoy watching grandkids and children have a good time with it. But what happens as you get older when it comes to Christmas presents? Now, some of you are still children, I realize. But by and large, you're sitting around and you're thinking, now, what am I going to get so-and-so for Christmas? My brother, my mother, my friend, my wife. What am I going to get them for Christmas? And in the country, and this might not be true in every country, but at least in this country, the older we get, does that get easier to come up with something or harder to come up with something? Obviously, it becomes harder because everybody's got everything that they could possibly need or want. And you say, well, if, I mean, what does he, what does he want? Well, if he wants something, he does what? He just goes and gets it. And so, um, you know, we've got a lot of stuff. And so, don't be overwhelmed with all of that. Don't, don't let that be your focus. Don't let that take over what's the most important things in life. We're to be walking, behaving properly. And we're to be focused. And we're to get out, wake up, get up. And get to work. And be responsible servants of God. Any questions or comments? Because we're still talking about love as I get into chapter 14. Right? I'm talking about love. And he says... He's going to turn his attention to a problem, not only in the church of that day, but, you know, in our day as well. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things, things of indifference. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. That's a good translation there, vegetables rather than herbs. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. Well, he gets into this issue of uh, what we call in our day, I guess, scruples. Uh, matters of indifference. You're going to see this word faith used. One who is we, he's not talking about the faith, the one, as Jude says, once for all delivered. But he's talking about a situation where I have an issue and I regard, I regard certain activities generally, maybe beliefs, but certain activities to be matters of faith for myself and therefore they become part of my faith. I mean, they're, they're, they're an issue for me, whether I take part or don't take part. Uh, like one commentator says, um, uh, 
uh, or some have translated this. Um, uh, he's talking about um, kind of observing my own man-made type rules and regulations. Um, the American Standard says, not for decision of scruples. The Revised Standard says, but not for disputes over opinions. Goodspeed says, do not criticize their views, Moffat, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his scruples. Another commentator says, but not with the idea of arguing over his scruples. So it's interesting when we talk about who is, when he's using the term weak. Now, when we think of somebody weak in the faith, normally, we use that term. What are we thinking of? By the way, I like what Thayer says, and I think this is the way the New American Standard reads, not for the purpose of passing judgment on opinions as to which one is to be preferred as the more correct. When I use the term generally, if, I, if you came up to me and said, well, so-and-so is weak in the faith, what would you be saying generally nowadays? Yeah, he's just a weak Christian. He, he's, he's weak in the gospel and in his, in his walk with Christ or in his knowledge. That's not what this weak in the faith here means. In fact, it's very possible, I like what Brother Mosier says, it's very possible, I mean, this is not necessarily a new Christian. This could be somebody in the church that's been, in the, been a Christian for 40 or 50 years. I'm not talking about a newbie necessarily, but he has a fragile conscience when it comes to some particular activity. That's a problem for him. Now, some commentators, when you're talking about eating these meats sacrificed to idols, some believe these are Jew, Jewish Christians because you remember Jews, before they became Christians, had what? What, what, was, their, what was their life like as far as their dietary laws? Yeah, they had all kinds of restrictions on clean and unclean meats. And that may be the case, but I can't, but I'm kind of seeing this maybe as a Gentile problem myself. That's just my, because I see the days, the next passage, part of the passage we get into is more of a Jewish problem. But the Gentiles, what kind of lifestyle did they live before they obeyed the gospel? Yeah, but particularly religiously, what kind of lifestyle did they live? They worshiped idols and they offered things to idols. So I become a Christian. I'm not going to offer animals and things to these idols anymore. And yet, you hand me some meat that's been offered to an idol and you ask me to eat it or tell me it's okay to eat it, what might I see as a former idolater? Why would that bother me? I'm not seeing the meat, I'm seeing the what? I'm seeing the idol that the meat was offered to. Well, if I eat this meat that's been offered to this idol, am I not approving of idol worship? Um, so it could go either way. These could be Jews that have problems going from the old law to the new freedom they have in Christ to eat whatever they want to. But it could be Gentiles that, that have come out of idolatry. But for whichever one it is... He sees the idol, and to eat this meat, it violates his conscience. And therefore he sins. Look at verse 23. He who doubts is condemned if he eats. Now that's not final judgment there, but he's violating his conscience. He does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. So he's got this problem. So, he's the weak brother. So what's the problem here? Why is he, telling, why is he having to say this? Don't judge these people. Receive them. Don't despise them. What apparently was happening? What was the strong, strong brother doing? And who is the strong brother? He's not necessarily stronger in knowledge of the gospel or been a Christian longer, but he's stronger in the sense that this is not an issue for him. He looks at this guy and says, what's your problem? What, 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 why can't you eat this? That, that idol's nothing. You should eat this. No. If you truly love, genuine love, you're not going to force this on him. 
so that he ends up violating his conscience. I'm just not going to do that. Just leave it alone. No need to get in arguments and fusses over these things. Hey, yeah. yeah the, the, the other thing, though, that a lot of people kind of uh, potentially, but they overlook is, is the second part of verse 3, which is referring to the other person involved. It says that you don't hold judgment against these other people. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street, and yeah, and we'll talk some more about that. But this is not... <laughs> These are not laws put on uh, a whole congregation of the Lord's church. And I think that's where some people miss the boat. First of all, he's not talking about matters of faith. So it's not an excuse to, to participate in uh, or, or, or promote false doctrine either. It has nothing to do with matters of faith. But it's also not an excuse to say, well... We have a congregation of 300 people and Sister Susie has an issue with blank. Therefore, we can't have this congregational function. Well, then who's running the congregation? Sister Susie is. And that's not what he's talking about either. He's talking about individuals having their own private faith, things that they have issues with. Well, let them have it. Leave them alone. But he's not... To, Frank, frankly, that person is supposed to, as you've mentioned, keep that to himself. I'll jump ahead a little bit, but Brother Moser gave an example of a congregation where he was at one time, and a fellow came up to him who had a problem with, uh, they had just started using the PowerPoint, putting songs on the screen. And this man was all upset because not only were the denominationalists doing that, but the progressives down the street were. And Brother Moser said, well, probably what I should have just said is, look, you know, if you have that, just keep it to yourself, you know. But he's too much of a smart aleck to leave it alone. So he said, well, the progressives down the street have doors and windows on their church building. What should we do about that? See? Uh, because we don't always think when we hold these particular views um, but nevertheless Christian love requires us to be patient with people and not go out of our way to offend people and certainly not cause them to violate their own conscience which is what's going to happen if this guy eats his meat the stronger brother pressing on him and pressuring him Keep it to yourself, verse 22, right? Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Um, but don't go around forcing it on other people, causing other people to sin. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you take both of these groups over this meat, is the person not eating the meat, can he go to heaven not eating that meat? Can the person eating the meat go to heaven if he eats the meat? Yes. So being weak in this particular way is nothing wrong with it. Now, not being weak in the faith, that's not a good thing. We need to grow. And so we ask a question, well, who are you to judge another's servant? I think that I believe that word for servant there is not, we normally see doulos, the, the, bond slave, the bond servant or slave. This is the word for a household servant. Who are you judging another man's household servant? Well, what's the point? Who does he serve? Who's his master? God. See, we're all servants of God. Well, I don't have a right to judge God's servants. He, he can make him stand even with his own quirks. But idols were a Gentile issue, but holy days were a Jewish issue, right? Look at verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced or persuaded in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Now he who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he does not eat 
To the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's interesting that this context, we, we generally quote this verse out of the context, although it does apply. But it's interesting the context it's in. He's talking about our, our tendency to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yet we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to, or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Now, I always thought this is interesting. Jewish holy days. What would be the, what would be the most obvious issue they might have? A Jew that's converted to Christianity in the first century. What, what would be the first thing that would come to your mind that's going to happen to them every week? <laughs> the Sabbath day. And what did Jews do on the Sabbath day? That's not a trick question. Nothing, right? Nothing. That, that's not technically true. They did, were allowed to do some things. But they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. Well, Sabbath comes along. I'm a new Christian. I'm a Jew. I might decide what? I'm just going to keep on doing what I've always done on the Sabbath. Well, that's okay. Well, let me ask you something. Is there any day in the New Testament under the new law in which a Christian cannot work? And this is not a trick question. Because when I was growing up, boy, this was, for some people, this was a hot button. You're going to work on Sunday? You're going to cut your yard on Sunday? Yes, I am. Because the weather's beautiful. And it's going to rain tomorrow. Can I do that or not do that? Yes, I can. Now, I do have an obligation on the first day of the week to do what? Worship. And frankly, there are some people that I hope are working on Sunday. Like a... Well, I hope the police are working on Sunday. I hope the people in the hospitals are working on Sunday. I hope the fire department's working on Sunday. There's a lot of people that I hope are working. I hope the military is not all sleeping on Sunday like they were on December 7th, 1941. Sleeping in on Sunday morning. But When it comes to these things, our first priority is to love one another. If you think it's wrong, Mr. Jew, to work on Saturday, don't violate your conscience. But I'm not going to push you into working. That wouldn't be love on my part. Ah, there's nothing wrong with working on Saturday. It's a new law now. You need to get out and get busy. No, you do what's best for you. Christ did not die and rise from the dead for us to do what? Argue over matters of indifference. Now, sometimes people will say things like, Christ didn't die for instrumental music. No, he did not. He died for a cappella, actually, because that's part of his new covenant. He died for matters of faith, but he didn't die for matters of indifference. So, He's observing these days. And so let him do that. You know, a lot of times these matters of indifference, our personal faith, scruple, whatever you want to call it, is generally based on our background, right? From where we came out of. I've seen this is generally what you see. I'm talking about in our day and age. For instance, People from a, a strong denominational background, whether it's uh, Protestant denomination or Catholic, 
Sometimes those will be the people that have problems with Christmas, for instance. Any celebration. Um, sometimes, um, uh, I'm not talking about a religious celebration. I'm talking about Santa Claus and all that, all the silly stuff we do. Uh, sometimes people have a hang up uh, with crosses. Why? Oh, you put a cross up here on the wall. Well, big deal. Isn't a cross the symbol of Christianity? Brother Mosier told the story of a, they had a get together, the students did, and I don't know how many years ago this was, but one of the students or student wives baked a cake in the shape of a cross. And one particular student just had a fit about that. He was the weak brother in this case. So the student who had brought the cake or wife baked the cake, he was the strong brother. What do you think he did? What's your problem? You can't eat this cake? Was that the loving way to handle it? What did the strong brother do in this, that case? Anybody know? He just took a knife and did what? He just cut up the cake. It's just a cake. We'll just cut it up. But maybe this other person had come out of Catholicism where you know they have these little trinkets that have some special... I call it voodoo type significance because that's really what Catholicism is. It's a combination of Christianity, Judaism, and paganism. And so they got all these superstitions. Brother Rice, when he traveled overseas and when he was in a country, let's say, that was predominantly Catholic, would not ever uh, celebrate Christmas over there. In, those, in some of these particular countries because he didn't want to give the wrong impression. Because to them, you can only celebrate Christmas in what way? It's only celebrated in a religious way. They don't understand a secular holiday known as Christmas. But in the United States, we're very familiar with that. Sometimes people say to me, well, no, you can't. I said, really? Well, some, would you tell my atheist neighbor that he can't celebrate Christmas? Why is he celebrating it? He didn't even believe in God. But he's still got a Christmas tree and he's got Rudolph in his front yard and lights on his house. Some people, you know, uh, Halloween's a big bugaboo, you know. You're dressing up like ghouls and goblins. and Okay, well, don't do it. If it bothers you, don't do it. Don't turn your porch light on. Don't put candy out for the kids. Be the Ebenezer Scrooge of Halloween. That's okay with me. That's okay. Don't celebrate it. Do not violate your conscience. By the same token, I'm not going to go up to that person and say, man, you're, what's your problem? In that circumstance. Keep those things to yourself. Have them to yourself. You think you're better than your brother? He asked that question in verse 10, right? Is that what you think? Why do you show content? You think you're better than him. No, you're not better than him. We'll all stand before Christ and answer for these things. And we'll pick up here next week, but did you know this principle even applies in dealing with non-Christians? If you have a little time before next week, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 23, and you'll see that this principle even applies when we're dealing with non-Christians, not just brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, we'll pick up there next week.